<laughs> being recorded. I can't imagine why. Okay, the, the topic for today is... This, what? The topic for today is the, the concept of Rosh Hashanah Zomadi. It's a shir that I always give before Rosh Hashanah because what it does is, to some degree, it helps focus um, a little bit about what's going on in Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is a very bizarre uh, type of day. It's bizarre because we know it is Yom Adin. It starts off the high holiday season. It's got all the tunes that we know for Yom Kippur. And yet, if we actually look at the content of it, it's very much not Yom Adin oriented. And we'll see. But first, let's start off at the beginning. If you take a look at source number two, we're going to cut this uh, a little bit short, some of it. If you take a look at source number two, it very simply states the following. There are four different times of year that we're judged. One of them we know, the other three we're not so used to thinking about. Maybe one other one we got. What are the four times of oh the year? Oh my god, I learned this. Do you learn this Mishnah? Yeah, yeah, it's a great Mishnah. You know. It's a great Mishnah. There are four times of the year we're judged. On Pesach, which start, is really the beginning of the Jewish year, not Tishrei. On Pesach, what ends up happening, we're judged because of Tfuah on Tfuah. How much Tfuah, right? On Atzeret, which is Shavuos, we're judged for the fruit of the trees. On Rosh Hashanah, Kol Bayo Olam, Ovin Lafanav, Kivnei Maron. Everybody passes in front of Hashem, Kivnei Maron, and there's a whole Shaila and Gemara. What exactly does this mean, Kivnei Maron? What is it? Some people say that it's like the Chayalim of David who walked in front of officers. Some people say it's like going, all different types of ideas of what is exactly is B'nai Maron. But we're all judged somehow individually on that day. And on Chag, Chag always stands for Sukkot. On Chag, we're judged for rain. Now, Chag, we know. We start switching the Teitel Matar. Uh, well, sorry, Mashiva Ruach Hamuri It's the beginning of the rainy season. That we know to some degree. The other ones don't. The, the, the basic question on this Mishnah, which we're not going to deal with, is if I have Rosh Hashanah, why do I need the other days? Meaning, if everything about me is getting judged on Rosh Hashanah, why do I need a separate day for Tua? Why do I need a separate day for Ring? Everything should be comprised or compressed into one day, and that's when I should be judged. That is a uh, Shiloh that we to deal with. That's not what we're going to deal with. Here I have this concept of Rosh Hashanah as Yom Hadin. Right? There's a problem with it. Think back biblically. Where do you have any place in the Bible that Rosh Hashanah is Yom Hadin? In fact, where do you have in the Bible any place that Aleph Tishrei is Rosh Hashanah? Yom Kippur, we know. There are a lot of people dealing with Yom Kippur that have to deal with forgiveness, etc. That we got. They have forgiveness. Got it. They have prayer. Got it. They have kapara. Got it. Right? Vidu of the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur for Kali Yisrael. Got it. Rosh Hashanah, what do I have? There's only two things I know from the text. Maybe three things I know from the text about Rosh Hashanah. And the text is in source number four. If you take a look. On the seventh month, on the first day of the month, which the seventh month and the first day of the month is when? Aleph Tishrei. It's actually the seventh month, not the first month. Yelachem Shabbaton, to Yantif, Zichron Trua, right? And remembrance of the Trua, Mikra Kodesh Kamalach Rabadal, Otasu. Vikraftem, Ishel Hashem. Similar thing in, in Bamidbar. All I know is that it's Yantif. I know that there's something to do with a shofar or a trua, and I know that there are karbonos. Sounds very much, if I take out the shofar, it sounds very much like a Rosh Chodesh. Does it say Rosh Hashanah? No. Does it say Yom Adin? No. So the question for today, which hopefully if we answer, will help us focus a little bit more on Tefillot of Rosh Hashanah. How did Rosh Hashanah take on this persona of Yom Adin? Where did it come from? It's not mentioned in the text. The girls, not only is it mentioned in the text, it's not mentioned in the prayer. You think about your Rosh Hashanah Davne. How many times do we say Vidu? None. How many times do we say Yedimumida? None. How many times do we ask for forgiveness? None. But it's Yom Adin. 
So wait a minute. On Yom Adin, you would assume that you would be doing what? Asking for forgiveness. Where is it? So it's not in the Tefillah and it's not in the Torah. How did it become Yom Adin? So I have four approaches. Biblical approach, spiritual approach, social approach, and then the metaphysical approach. The metaphysical approach is going to be the most important for shaping our Rosh Hashanah and to some degree giving it a feel that it hadn't had before. Let's just take a look at the biblical approach first. Biblical approach is, it says the following. When we take a look at the Tishrei month, we see that it is the end of what type of cycle? It's not the, when we see Tishrei, it doesn't seem to be the end of the year for, for, or the beginning of the year for anything. But in a exactly. biblical sense, what is the end? Of, it is the end of one type of cycle. What cycle is it the end of? Like starting on the no, no, not, not, not something spiritual. We can't see that. But we see, even in the Torah, that it is the end of the cycle. Shemitah. 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 It's the end of Shemitah. It's the end of the Shemitah cycle. Which means what? It's the end of which type of cycle? Yovel. Yovel also, but what type of cycle? Uh, dealing with? Physical. Dealing with agriculture. And if you take a look, Rosh Hashanah is the end of an, or Tishrei is the end of an agricultural cycle. Why? When do we start to plant? Pesach. When do we start to, or, or I shouldn't say that. When do we, when do we, when do we start to, 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 to plow, plant, etc.? Pesach. When do we reap? When do we cut everything? Shavuos. When do we gather it in? Sukkot. Sukkot. What's the end of the cycle? The what part? Gathering. Gathering in part. So if I take a look at source number five, V'chagat katsia b'kurei ma'asecha shetzitra b'sadeh, V'chaga asif b'tzei ta'ashana v'asbechat ma'asecha minasadeh. The time of Chag Asif, what's another name for Chag Asif? Sukkis. Chag Asif is Tzeta Shana. It's the end of the Shana. Now, girls, if it's the end of the Shana, it's also, ipso facto, the beginning of the Shana. Meaning, the cycle ends in Tishrei and begins in Tishrei. If I take a look at source number six, the Safat al Chas Sheva Shabtot Shanim, Sheva Shanim, Sheva Pamim, the Yul Chayim Sheva Shabtot Shanim, Right? The Yovel. Seven Shemitahs. Right? Seven Shemitahs. Then I have Yovel. And Yovel starts when? Rosh Hashanah time. And then it ends when? Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur time. It's the end of the agricultural cycle. Now I'm skipping a number of things because basically, basically we don't have enough time. But if I take a look... What's the most important thing in Eretz Yisrael that deals with agriculture? Rain. Rain, correct? Now, I, I've said this many times in Midrash and in other places I teach, I say very many, many times. Americans and people from England don't know the importance of rain. Why? Now maybe America does. Because there's been a drought in America and every, all the prices on food went up. But the fact is that what? You get rain almost all the time. In England you get rain all the time, mm -hmm. right? In Israel, it hasn't rained since when? Since around Pesach time. It's almost six months that it hasn't rained. Now, there was a drizzle this morning. There was a little drizzle. It was like somebody spitting. That's how much water it was. I walked out of my house, I kept I'm getting wet. And I was like, look around, is there a sprinkler on? And then I noticed that it was on the floor. It lasted for about five minutes. It did absolutely nothing. But it caused me to be excited. Why? Hey, rain. <laughs> and I said to this to you last year, that when it rains here, you, when it rains in America, when it rains here, my kids put on their rain boots, they take an umbrella, they take their raincoat, and they go outside and they play in the rain. It could be raining for five minutes. It could be a drizzle. It's a big deal for them. It's like the first snow in America. What happens if there is no rain? How bad is it? Don't think modern society, think biblical society. What happens if there is no rain? They don't have any like, income or anything. They, they don't have any survive. food. Right? Now, Israel is different than all Mideast countries. It's different in the aspect of what? We don't have a natural water source. All our water is dependent on what? Mm. It's on rain. And therefore, if we don't get rain, what happens? 
We don't have food. If we don't have food, we start to starve. If we start to starve, what happens? Other nations see us starving, what do they automatically do? Biblically, what do they do? They come and attack us, why? Because we're weak. They come and attack us, a lot of people die. There are dead bodies all around. What happens? Dead bodies, starvation, low resistance, what happens? Disease, pestilence. And in the end, what happens? Catastrophe. Now we don't think that because, okay, so it rained, it didn't rain. I used my rain boots, I didn't. It's like the question when everybody goes to Poland. Uggs or rain boots? Okay, so I didn't wear my... Uh... You'll learn, that's a major question in life. It's not like Treblinka or Belzec, it's like Uggs or rain boots. It's like, I'm oh, sorry, did I say that? It's not nice. Don't say things like that. The fact is like this. The fact is that what ends up happening, what ends up happening is that if there's no rain, it's catastrophe in Eretz Yisrael. When is the rain decided? So take all the pasuk, uh, uh, the source number eight from Dvarim Perik Yid Aleph. Ki ha'aretz v'shah atav v'asham v'rishta, lo ki ha'aretz v'tzrayim hi, v'shah zasatim v'sham v'shah tzra tzarecha, v'shkit v'rad v'cha, k'gana yarak, v'aretz v'shah atav v'rim v'sham v'rishta, eretz harim v'kod, v'matar shamayim, tishtem mayim. We're not like Eretz Mitzrayim. We don't have natural water. It's only matar shamayim, it's only rain. Eretz asher Hashem lokech adoresh el tatami, now listen carefully. The one time you have that you have a reshit shana is really when? Rainy season, which is in which month? Tishrei. In other words, what? It's not only the fate of the rain that's being decided in this month. But because the fate of the rain is being decided in the month, what else is being decided in this month? The fate of the people. And if they don't get rain, what happens? They die. And everybody knows that now is crunch time. Now, getting the rain isn't dependent on seeding the clouds. It's dependent on what? Us doing what? Mitzvah. Right? In other words, what? It's dependent on mitzvah. Which, the people at this point in time, what are they going to be doing like nobody's business? They're going to be doing tshuva. Why? Because they realize what? They realize that if I don't do tshuva, if God doesn't, if I don't find favor in God's eyes, what's going to happen? <coughs> it's going to be a catastrophe in Eretz Yisrael. And all of a sudden, this beginning of the agricultural year, this Rosh Hashanah becomes what? Yom Adin. You're feeling the pressure. Now, Menachem Liptek has very, very, Menachem Liptek, a very interesting comment. This is a following, very interesting idea. It says, in biblical times, how did they wake up people? How did they call people to battle? How did they tell people something's going on? How'd they do it? Shofar. In other words, what? We blow the shofar on this day, wake up everybody and tell them what? It's crunch time. Start doing tshuva. We need to make sure that we have this rain or else what? We're all dead. And therefore, this day becomes a Yom Adin, including in it the Shofar. That's one approach to how Rosh Hashanah became Yom Adin. Again, I'm doing it very quickly because we don't have enough time. There's also the spiritual approach. The spiritual approach is in source number one. And the spiritual approach is very interesting. The Gemara in Rosh Hashanah says a very interesting thing, not spoken about it, a very interesting thing happened on Rosh Hashanah. What happened? The Aleph Tishrei Nivra Olam. On Aleph Tishrei, the world was created. How do we see that in Davani? You all sing it in Davani. Not Davani today, Davani on Rosh Hashanah. Tani, stop even thinking about it. It's a different Nusaf you're talking about. <laughs> Hayom harat olam, hayom yamid v'mishpat. You say it after every time you pull the shofar. The fact is of what? Today was the day the world was created. It's a mistake. The Gemara is mistaken. The world wasn't created on Aleph Tishrei. The world was created on Chaf El. What was created on Aleph Tishrei? Man. Man is the world. So I'm saying to you, according to men, at least the opinions I know, Chaf Elo. Aleph Tishrei was the creation of man. Man is the reason behind the world. That's why it says the world was created. Hold on, girls, listen to this. 
So the, 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 if you turn your page, the Rabbeinu Nisim, the Ran, a comment in the Gemara, we're not going to get involved in what he's commenting on, tries to explain how Rosh Hashanah became Yom Adin. And he says the following. So what happened on the first day of the creation of man? It was an intensely busy day. God decided he was going to create man. Then he went to check with angels. After he checked with angels, he gathered the dirt. After he gathered the dirt, he put in some water, you know, like a good recipe. Put in a little bit of water. After he put in the water, he mixed everything around. And then what did he do? He made a mold. After he made the mold, he breathed life into man. Then what happened? Man got up and he walked around. Then what happened? He brought him the animals, did it up, told him not to eat from the tree. What happened on the first day right after he got told not to eat from the tree? He ate from the tree. <laughs> What happens right after that? Sort of like when you tell somebody, don't look out the left window of the bus. What does everybody do? They look out the left window. If you didn't want them to look out the left window, what should you say? Don't look out the right window. And everybody would look the wrong way. Psychologically, it works. So the fact is like this, don't eat from the tree. He eats from the tree, he gets judged. And let me ask you a question. That is he Yodzei from Beitin of a Kodesh Baruch Chai of a Potter. Wait, what? Is Adam Arishon on the first day when he judged, is he Yotzi from Beitin Chayav Apata? Yeah, that's right. He's Yotzi half and half. What was supposed to happen to Adam Arishon when he ate in the tree? He was supposed to die. supposed to die. What happened to him? He didn't. He didn't die. In other words, God had what on him? Rachamim. So the Ran says, you know why Rosh Hashanah became Yom Adin? Because God, in His infinite mercy, picked a day that what? That had already in it, historically, God having mercy on mankind. So this way, when you're judged, God will remember what? That He's a merciful judge. The spiritual approach says, why pick Rosh Hashanah as you? How did it become Yom Adin? Because God wanted to make sure in his deen of human beings, it's rachami. It's a beautiful idea. Usually when you go to court, the judge wants to do what? Throw the book at you. God doesn't want to throw the book at you. God doesn't want to lock you away. God really wants to have one on you. Rachamim. He can't just let, let things go. But in essence, he's looking for opportunities to do what? Have rachamim on you. It's so beautiful. God is looking to have mercy on us. The so, question we have to ask ourselves is, are we looking to invoke God's mercy? And do we take the opportunities given to us to invoke God's mercy? Or do we just say, no? Nah. It's amazing. It's like a parent and a child sometimes. You know, sometimes the child is having a tantrum bad day. So the parent tries everything possible can't just let it go, but tries everything possible to have the kid calm down, right? If you calm down, I'll give you a taffy. No. If you calm down, what would you call it? Come sit on my lap and calm down. No. It's just say you're sorry, you won't get a punishment. No. I'll let you do it. No. The parent is dying to give the kid what? Rachamim. And what does the kid keep doing again and again? Rejecting Rachamim. It's like God stretching out his hand to us and saying, come with me. And what do we keep saying? No. no. Thanks, I'm not interested. But you're going to get punished if you don't come with me. Oh, yeah. All right, whatever. Until the punishment comes. Then we get what, the whack in the head. What happens? Why didn't you have Rachamim on me? Because 15 times he tried already and we didn't want it. So that's what the Ron says. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it quickly. There's another opinion, Rabbi Yeshua, we're not going to get involved. The social approach is the approach of the Miri in source number 11. Really, we're trying to get source number 12 and 15. Source number 11 is a social approach. The Miri says the following. Well, he asks the same question everybody has. Why Rosh Hashanah Yom Adin? Where did it come from? So this is very simple. It became Yom Adin. God made it Yom Adin also for a good reason. Because at this point in time, what is a person doing? Collecting all his profit of the year. In agricultural society, it's collecting what? All the wheat, all the fruit. You're collecting everything. What do you feel when you collect everything? What do you feel when you look at your profit over the year? Proud. You're proud. You feel good about yourself. It's like camp. I ran two camps this summer. A sleepaway camp and a regular camp. A day camp. 
when I ran the camp, I don't think of how much money did it I'm making or not making, etc. Losing time. I just have to deal with everything. Afterwards, I sit back and I make a cash flow. Did I make money? Did I lose money? If I made money, I feel good, right? What's the problem with feeling good when you make money? Become horny. And you think, who made the money? I made the money. It's a natural reaction. Look what I did. You know, all during the school year, people are working, working, working hard, 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 sometimes dominating for a test, etc. They get the report card. What's the first thing that they feel when they get all A's? Close. What a good job I did. In the meantime, what happened? The 16 tutors, the 15, you know, you know, hours a week that you were crying, the tefillot mincha you had before a final, those you forgot about. All of a sudden, look at me, I'm so good. It's a natural reaction. Except if you have Yom Adin right in the middle of when you're counting your profit. Because then the Yom Adin automatically makes you remember what? It's from Hashem. And the Miyuri says God put it there because he was worried that what were you going to do? He was worried that you're going to look too much. Look at me. Look at me. Look how great I am. By the way, Shana Bekros. This is an interesting thing for a Shana Bek. I just thought of it. Why? You come back Shana Bek. You're like rolling like you're... You're, you're, like, you're like the bosses in the place. When you came into Midrash at the first time, you felt like a freshman. Where am I going? What am I doing? Where's the bathroom? What are these three other girls, five other girls in my room? Where do I get the supplies? How do I get on the train? What's a Rav Kav? Rav who? Who's Kav? What guy is a Rav Kav? Which rabbi is that? I don't take any of his classes. And now you come back, you see all the people doing the same exact thing that you do. They have no idea up, down, right, left, where they're going, which class to take. And you feel, wow, I'm a senior. <laughs> And Yom Adin comes around and starts saying, maybe you have more to accomplish. Maybe you have more to accomplish. Maybe there's something more out there. It's nice every once in a while Yom Adin to knock you back at the place. The last approach, and with this we're going to finish. I went over time, but this we're going to finish is the following. It's a metaphysical approach. It's based on the Slanam Rebbe and the Siva Shalom. He says the following thing. If you take a look at one of the recorded Rosh Hashanahs that we have, it's after Ezra and Nehemiah come back and they find the Jewish people in a horrible state. They do all these things to fix up, to fix up the Jewish people. And they're having the first Rosh Hashanah. And the Pesukim in source number 12 says, V'yomer nechem ya'ewa t'rera, Levim v'vinei al-chava, Al t'ablu, al t'fku, ki bochim kol ha'am b'shanam v'tibayin al-Torah. The people on this Rosh Hashanah heard the Torah, they were crying, like babies. And what is Ezra nechem? You would think, look, think of the picture. You have all these people that are not from intermarried, assimilated. It's Rosh Hashanah, you bring them into the shul, all of a sudden everybody starts crying that they've done bad. You as the key of expert of the place probably feel, yes, right? Because look, they're all being Makari. What does Ezra and Nechemi say? No, no, stop crying. What does he say? He says the following. No, no, stop crying. Go home. Have a great meal. Invite guests. Give presents. God wants your happiness. Can you imagine that? Everybody's crying. It. The rabbi in Shul, he said a drasha, a Yom Kippur. Everybody's crying. They want to do tshuva. You would think that the rabbi is great. The rabbi says, no, no, stop crying. No, no, I didn't mean for you to cry. Stop crying. Go home, have a good yantif meal. What's going on? And in fact, the Torah says, we are unlike every other nation in the world. Every nation has a Yom Adin. What do they do? They dress up, they're austere, they're, they're, they're nervous, they're, they're worried. What do we do when we have Yom Adin? We have a great meal with Simanim. We sit around the table saying, Dip the apple in the ani, make the bracha loud and clear. Shana tovu matuka. We do tashlef, right? I'm going to the Mayan, won't you come along? All these cute songs. Where's the... Ayay, we're horrible. Ayay, we're evil. Ayay, don't... Where's that? But you don't have that at the Rosh Hashanah meal, right? You have, hey, let's try to make as many simanim as possible. Like, I don't do a fish head. I take jellyfish, I cut off the tails, I cut off the heads, and then basically I use jellyfish as my heads. Who wants to eat a fish head? Everybody wants to eat a jellyfish head. <laughs> Later on, after the meal, they eat the tails also. <laughs> Maybe we're wrong in doing that, but that, right? That's what you do. 
So what happened to Yom Adin? So the Islam says the following brilliant idea. It changed the whole way I view Rosh Hashanah. Brilliant. It's based on the Avi. It's like this. The birthday of the world is Rosh Hashanah. On the day that one year passed, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, like any good businessman, does a review of the project. He reviews the project. And what does he look for? Is the project advancing the way I want? Or is the project not advancing the way I want? If the project is not advancing it the way I want, so what do I have to do? I have to quit the project. I have to stop the project. A businessman knows. If you review after a year and you're losing money all over the place, what do you do? You stop and you have to start over again. You have to start a new thing. Your plan was wrong. Your plan's not working. And if the project might not be making a profit, but in general is going in the direction that you want, so what do you do? Every good businessman knows you keep it. You review it once a year, you see what's going on. The Kodesh Baruch Hu gave the world enough spiritual energy to last one year. At the end of the year, Kodesh Baruch Hu has to review the world and see, should I let the world continue for another year? If the answer is that the world is going in the general direction of Kodesh Baruch Hu wants, one more year. And if we're going horribly backwards, what? Shalom al Yisrael. According to the Medrash, he already did it six times. But it's not only the world, it's what? Oh. It's every individual. God looks at every single person. And what do they see with every single person? They see, is the person going in the direction I want or not? Is the person going in the direction I want? If the answer is yes, might not be a tzaddik, might do a very response, but in general, they're going, they're trying to fulfill the mission of God on earth. So let's try, give him another year, maybe he'll get it all right. But if the guy rejects the mission God gave him on earth, if the guy rejects all of this, then what happens? End. I don't need you. What do I need you? You're costing me money. So the Salam says there's a difference between the Deen on Yom Kippur and the Deen on Rosh Hashanah, and it's amazing. The Deen on Yom Kippur, you have to go through every single thing you did wrong. Your Lashon Haras, your Davenings, your Brachos, your Tzniyas, everything. You have to go through it. One after another, you have to go through every single thing to see if you did the right thing and you did the wrong thing. You know, I try to uncover. That's not the Deen on Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is not about that. Rosh Hashanah is whether you're willing to accept your mission in the world. Whether you accept the purpose for which you were created for in the world. Whether you're willing to accept God's tafkid for you in the world. If the answer is yes, you get another, you get another year. If the answer is no, chas v'shalom. And that's why Ezra told the people, go away. Go home. Eat your meal. Why? The minute they started crying for every meaningless thing they've done in the past years, when they were doing all these bad things, is the minute they accepted what upon themselves? Hashem's mission for themselves upon themselves. They realized everything that they lived in their life before was what? It was nothing. And now they were rededicating themselves. Ezra says to them, hey, you passed. Go home, have a meal. You passed the judgment. Not the Yom Kippur judgment. You passed the Rosh Hashanah judgment. And that's why Rosh Hashanah has nothing to do with it. The classic idea of chuba. I did three hours of Rosh Hashanah and I bought them two hours and I didn't say a bracha and God forbid I looked at a boy. That's why it's not. That's why it's, that's Yom Kippur. But Shoshana Davani is, are you willing to accept the role God put you here? God put you in the world for a reason. Now, girls, at your age and your stage of where you are, it's quite difficult sometimes to do what? Know why a Kodesh Baruch Hu put you here. How do you ever do that? Hold on. But what must you do to pass the judgment? You don't have to get the answer. What must you do? You must ask the question. But not ask the question like a Sem girl who says, Rabbi, what am I supposed to do with my life? Don't throw it away. It's not a throwaway question. It's the most important question in your existence. And how do you pass the judgment of Rosh Hashanah? You dive into a Kodesh Baruch Hu and you say to him, Kodesh Baruch Hu, I want to be a Kli. I want to be your vessel in this world. Kodesh Baruch Hu, I want to do what you've destined, my destiny. I want to do what you want me to do in this world. I want to be your Evet. I want you to be my Melech. I want to serve you like an Evet serves a Melech. Like a Ben serves an Av. I want to do it. But what? 